Good morning. Um, so I, I, a blockchain conversation may be a bit of a stretch for 9 a.m., so I hope all of you are caffeinated um, uh, and, and ready to roll. And uh, to some degree, I'm going to try to answer your questions about what is a blockchain, um, why should you care. Uh, but I also want to talk about what we're building at the project, which is as much about technology as it is about uh, the way that open source communities come together to write code, especially in a part of the technology landscape that is still very unsettled and is still emerging. Um, and before I dive in, how many people here feel like they could do a 140 character tweet explaining what a blockchain is? Okay, um, uh, so at, a, at, at the most general level, a blockchain is really a decentralized database, right? It's a way of taking a circle of computers, basically, owned by different people, and publishing to that circle um, uh, 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 information, um, basically entries that get added to a ledger, right? And this is the distributed ledger portion of a blockchain. Um, and then building on top of that uh, to be, be able to publish scripts uh, written in a language that is particular to that chain. It diff differs from all the different implementations out there. Um, but uh, but be, to be able to write scripts and have those scripts execute across all these different nodes. And if they all agree on the outcome, then the next link in that, that entry in that ledger can be written. Right? So this is kind of cool, and it's something that wasn't invented by Satoshi Nakamoto. This is something that actually goes back uh, to some degree to papers from the 1980s on distributed computing, uh, on, uh, uh, on ways to scale databases to, to much higher levels. Um, but we kind of forgot about it as an industry, as, as, a, as, as academia, until um, Satoshi Nakamoto's paper in 2009, suggesting that you could combine that with a consensus mechanism. Consensus is how everybody in that circle agrees to the next link in the chain, um, the next entry in that ledger. Uh, uh, and, and his proposal was something called proof of work. And I'm not going to talk a lot about cryptocurrencies in this talk, because to many degrees, Bitcoin and, and even Ethereum are kind of uh, uh, these systems that are about building very large global uh, platforms for distributed computing, in addition to being about cryptocurrencies. And cryptocurrencies have their own political issues, they have their own uh, uh, social issues as well. Um, what Hyperledger uh, was started with was this idea that if we can boil down this underlying data structure, this distributed ledger technology and the smart contract platform, uh, and take it to the business world. In fact, many of the people who were involved in, in starting the Hyperledger project came from the, the business community, the banks, uh, the, 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 the other technology areas where they felt this need for a very flat, distributed, multi-party database uh, uh, ledger and smart contract system. There there is a need for it, and a need that could be separated from the cryptocurrency side in a, in a really interesting way. So that was the genesis for the project. Um, the project actually began with conversations starting about a year ago with organizations like IBM and Wells Fargo and JP Morgan uh, and Intel and others coming to the Linux Foundation saying, there's a need here. There's a need to build uh, uh, technologies that, that uh, focus on this blockchain space uh, that, that help build these, these kind of building blocks for, for building these kinds of systems. And, and when I joined in June, I I went out and talked to all of the members of the organization at the time, which was about 40-odd members, uh, and, and said, what, what is the most valuable thing that the Linux Foundation and the Hyperledger Project could do for this, for this community? Especially given that um, projects like Bitcoin and Ethereum are pioneering some really interesting things. There's this long tail of a lot of other open source projects. What's the best thing we could do? And, the, and, and so the goals that we came up with were to build a, a developer-focused community of communities Right, so a collection of different projects uh, to benefit an ecosystem of solutions providers and end users building blockchain technologies. Right, um, and through through building these communities, build uh, a family of frameworks, of platforms, and libraries uh, upon which anyone can build and run their own applications. Kind of the open source story, in some ways inspired as much by the Linux Foundation as by the Apache Software Foundation. Right, uh, where where you find 300 odd, maybe it's even 400 at this point projects uh, ranging from Hadoop and Spark uh, all the way back to the original web server project, um, sitting side by side with healthy communities building technologies. Um, 
We also, as a project, want to make sure that we're involving these developers and, and service providers and others in, in promoting the software publicly and building a commercial ecosystem on top of it, uh, because that's really how you build resiliency into an open source community. Make sure people can make money with it, right? Make sure that it's something that they can put into practical use uh, and derive some value from, uh, uh, either indirectly as a, as a service provider or the, uh, buried inside their organization, or even directly as, as providing support or or products based on top of it. And finally, as a project, host the infrastructure for this, not just the mailing list, CVS, or, or Git repositories, and, and, and other things, but also uh, uh, the legal kind of infrastructure that you need. Um, you all know about the Linux Foundation, you know who uh, we are, uh, you know that in addition to the Linux ecosystem, there's all these additional kind of template communities that have been built, uh, uh, Cloud Foundry, Node.js, um, uh, Zen, and, and this is what the Hyperledger project is plugging into as a framework. Um, Within the Hyperledger project, we've added, uh, 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 we now have uh, over 85 members. Um, this is, I refer to as kind of my NASCAR slide um, of uh, you know, the companies that are supporting this effort. Uh, uh, and supporting uh, means uh, making a financial contribution. It also uh, can mean, I mean, it can mean that. It can also mean participating technologically uh, uh, in terms of using the code, but also contributing uh, uh, bug reports, contributing enhancements, uh, being a part of the open source project. Anybody in the world can obviously, like any with any Linux Foundation project, use the code, modify it, redistribute it, become a part of the developer community, become all the way to a core maintainer uh, without paying a dime. But these are the companies that believe enough in the vision of what we've built, including uh, companies like Huawei, like Red Hat, like Intel, and obviously like IBM, uh, uh, who believe in what we're doing. Uh, what, what we're also informed by is this vision, and I think this separates us from a lot of the, the current um, uh, communities building blockchain technology in that we don't believe there's only going to be one, one global chain. Right? Many of the cryptocurrency advocates believe, well, everything will be about this particular chain, and there might be side chains that plug in and out, but, but there's just one core, and they compare it to TCP IP. And the comparison for me is, is a bit strained with, with TCP IP, and in fact, if we said that that was the model, I would worry because it's taken 20 years to move from TCP IP version 4 to version 6, and we're only about a third of the way through that migration. Um, uh, so it's not exactly the best model if you want to talk about this really thriving, active community. Um, HTTP might be a better example, but, but even, even here we're talking about a space where every few months there's, there's such a dramatic shift in the thinking and the technology, and I won't even go into talk about the DAO hack uh, and, and other things, things that have caused this community to really grow up and harden and learn about resiliency. Um, but uh, fundamentally, I think we believe in the project that there will be always be a, some number of public uh, blockchains um, that people plug into, um, uh, and, and many of those would be currency driven, but there also will be million, millions of private chains, basically uh, distributed databases that are designed for a particular marketplace or for a particular application. Um, to give an example, uh, there's a, a, a company called Everledger that is working with De Beers and others in the diamond industry to build a uh, diamond tracking blockchain. And um, this is a database that every company that plays a role in, in diamonds, whether it's from pulling it out of the ground to selling it, you know, like one distributor to another, to getting it into the retail stores, everybody there will write to this blockchain whenever a diamond changes hands. Right, with a tracking number specific to that diamond. And it turns out diamonds, if you hold them in light a certain way, actually create a unique pattern that you can use as an ID, not quite a QR code, but pretty close. Um, and so using that to track diamonds through the system, you can try to keep blood diamonds from entering the, uh, in, entering the market. And that's the whole point of making it a chain. It actually echoes a paper-based process that that industry uses now called the Kimberly process. Um, but it's, again, paper-based, it involves fax machines, it involves when you want to query and see where has this diamond been or where did it come from, that can take uh, 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 weeks to get an answer to that. Ideally, with, with a chain, if they set it up right, you'd be able to query that and see instantaneously the provenance of where that diamond came from. And, and that's really cool. And, and that's something that doesn't have to depend upon the price of a Bitcoin or, or whether the Ethereum network is up or splits or something like that. This is something that that industry and all the participants could set up. It might even be a public chain. Um, uh, but something that can trace that, that, um, that flow of diamonds is really essential and really needed. Um, and there's use cases all over the map as well, not only in financial services, 
but in uh, healthcare, uh, in supply chain, other supply chain things like uh, the ethical seafood movement, for example. If you could trace where this fish in this package that you see at the supermarket, where it comes from, where it was caught, in a way that you had high guarantees, where it's actually accurate at each uh, step, that would, that would change how that industry works and drive a lot more of the ca fish catch towards ethical, uh, ethical practices. So that's, that's kind of the idealistic hope of many people who operate in this chain um, in, in, in the blockchain space and something we're trying to tap into with Hyperledger. Um, the other important point to make though, I think, is that uh, uh, this is, this is 19, like 1994 in the web. Um, the technologies are still really young. In 1994, if you told a bank that it could use a website to communicate with, uh, uh, with, its, with its account holders, um, most of them would say, what is the web still uh, in 94? That was still not quite at the zeitgeist, not quite you know, on David Letterman or whatever. Um, uh, but people were starting to find out about it. But those who had would very credibly state, well, there's no encryption for the connection between a browser and a server yet. You know, there's some proposals here and there and some experiments, but you know, anybody listening on the wire would be able to, to sniff a bank account. Um, and they would be accurate. And it wasn't until end of 95, beginning of 96, when uh, Netscape and, and a few others first published the SSL specification that you could credibly say, no, we have a decent uh, level of encryption between client and server. Um, I, uh, blockchain technologies have some of the answers here, uh, especially when it comes to confidentiality of, being, of what's being written to a common chain. But there's still some big challenges there. So at Hyperledger, we're trying to build these, uh, the, basically these building blocks as, as, as independent communities, as projects very much uh, in the line of the Apache Software Foundation mode of a team of volunteer developers building code in the open publicly, managing their own roadmap and release schedule, um, responsible for following Hyperledger policies and requirements about you know, where, the, where the code comes from and that sort of thing. Um, but also very significantly, these projects need to be encouraged to look at the other projects and think about common ways to, to work together, right? Ways to reduce duplication of effort, ways to um, uh, build to each other's interfaces. So in contrast to an Apache Software Foundation project, um, uh, here we actually expect the projects to, to uh, think of it as being one step curated, right? Right? We're not going to solve this with a top-down architecture or say there's one true way to build a blockchain, but from a bottoms-up perspective, we can get there if there's a cultural uh, uh, mandate for the projects to, to look at what the others are doing. Um, across all of the projects, there is a common license, the Apache software license. Not only, and I might be bigoted about it because I, I helped write it, um, but uh, I, I, it, it was actually chosen before I joined the project as the standard license. And the reason why a single standard license is important in this community is if, these, if we have these projects that in some ways compete, in some ways explore different uh, aspects of, of, of solving this technology, we need to be able to share code between them because a project might might thrive, it might find its footing and have a huge developer following. It might also just kind of um, sit there and have a few users. And you want to be able to bring what's, what works about that technology into another technology, uh, into another project, without it feeling like uh, there is a winner and a loser. Right? And so this is about kind of the social dynamics of this space. You kind of want uh, uh, some Darwinian competition, right? Uh, I, I, you know, where where you know, there's some, some actual like, uh, energy there, but, but you want people to not feel like they've lost something if their project gets merged into another one. Right? Um, so common software license makes that easier to do. Right? It would be much harder if there were different licenses that either made that relationship one way or even incompatible. Um, you need a common IP framework as well. And, and like most Linux Foundation projects, all of them perhaps, uh, we use the developer certif certificate of origin as a way to make sure that the developers um, actually are, uh, uh, wrote the code that they're submitting. Um, common collaboration framework, uh, promotion and branding. I mean, these are the kinds of things the Linux Foundation knows how to do and is bringing to this effort. Um, and eventually, it'll be uh, we'll have common security practices as well for reporting uh, security holes that you want to try to push out to the public. So the two flagship projects we have today at Hyperledger are Fabric, which is based on this consensus mechanism uh, called uh, Practical Byzantine Fault Tolerance. Um, this is, again, one of those uh, ideas that goes back to the 1980s about how if you have a circle of 10 or 20 uh, participants in your blockchain, how do you decide which is the next link in the chain? And that's a consensus, a quorum-driven kind of uh, method. There's, but we're looking at making that pluggable so that other consensus mechanisms can come in as well. Um, that was originally developed by IBM. 
uh, written in Go, the programming language. Uh, and uh, since it was contributed, we've had other active developers on the project uh, from uh, DTCC, London Stock Exchange, uh, Digital Asset Holdings, uh, and, and a long tail of other, other open source contributors. Um, Sawtooth Lake is uh, a different project. It's based on a different principle called proof of elapsed time. You could think of it like proof of work, except you don't actually burn the CPU power. You have the, a core, uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting. You have a core, uh, or something called the SGX extensions to the Intel chips that um, uh, basically make an attestation that uh, a certain amount of elapsed time has, has happened in that CPU. And you use that as a way to drive the process to decide who gets to anoint the next link in the chain. Um, I'm doing a horrible job explaining it. Uh, uh, much more information is available uh, at that project. Um, there's some more that we've added as well, kind of add-on projects. Um, uh, we've also uh, started to open the door to conversations with other communities, other projects about coming in. Um, and these are projects that are either complementary to or actually perhaps even competitive with uh, Fabric and Sawtooth Lake, but that's okay. Again, a little Darwin, never killed anyone. I guess it did. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, let's, to get, let's, let's, let's stoke some of that up, right? Um, so we're interested in stuff that is about unpermissioned chains, the, the big public uh, currency based ones. Um, there's a lot of interesting work going on there. Portable identities, especially those that might cross these different chains that, are, that, that, that we see emerging. Um, smart contract engines, there's a lot of uh, hard work going on there because everyone has their favorite language. You have a lot of questions about how general should a smart contract language be. If it's too general and too flexible, you run a much higher risk of a future uh, uh, compromise event like we saw with the DAO. Um, but, uh, but sometimes you really need that flexibility to do creative things. Um, uh, lots of interesting stuff going on in the world of homomorphic encryption and um, secure multi-party computing. These are basically ways of being able to say, I can write encrypted entries into the chain, and somebody else can uh, uh, analyze those encrypted records and make a, uh, an interesting statement about them, such as, you know, uh, it's a system of accounts, I've added this, I've subtracted this. You can't see the underlying details, but you could see the net uh, by, by performing some mathematical operations on it. Um, this is still fairly sci-fi, um, fairly advanced, um, but if we can help boil those algorithms down to something that becomes a library, becomes production quality, I think we'd make a real contribution out there. Um, and then finally, there's all these interesting efforts around medical records, supply chains, the energy markets. Um, I don't see us doing end user applications. That's still something we depend upon developers and partners to build. But if there's something we can do in this space that raises the floor uh, on common technology, we're interested. Um, why do we even exist? I, try, I think I've tried to answer that in some of the last few slides. Um, but as, as you all know, because all of you are developers, and I'm sure all of you have contributed to open source projects, collaboration is, is hard. I mean, it, it, it sounds like a, a pithy kind of thing, but um, uh, getting the social dynamics right, getting the licensing right, getting the community dynamics right is something that doesn't, it isn't as easy as just starting a GitHub repo. Right, um, And the world has way too many projects that are one company projects, one developer projects, uh, and this space has a lot of those as well. And I think that's holding it back. It's certainly holding it back when it comes to adoption by, by the banks, by, uh, by large companies who are thinking about this as like a core part of how they reinvent their markets. Right? Um, and I think that's something that we can provide in the same way that the Linux Foundation helped make um, uh, the Linux technology stack, something that even the most conservative companies could go, okay, I understand this. Let me bring this in uh, and, 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 and can get comfortable with it, right? Um, and, and if we have competing licenses, competing brands, uh, competing user bases, that kind of collaboration gets even harder. Um, uh, and, and, and we know if this community is fragile, then, uh, then, then, it, then getting user confidence is, is, a, is a really big challenge. Um, there's, there's one final thought I want to give, which is, um, you know, especially how we might relate to the other organizations out there in the blockchain and cryptocurrency space. So um, I've, I've been at this for a while, and, 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 and I'm sure many of you have as well, and we've uh, kind of seen that the way that internet technologies tend to get developed um, is through a partnership between three different kinds of organizations. Um, maybe two and a half, because sometimes the third isn't always needed, um, but, but uh, uh, the three that I, that I see uh, are uh, the standards bodies, like the IETF, the W3C, um, and ISO. Uh, the implementers, like whether it's a vendor or it's somebody like the ASF, uh, or, or the Linux Foundation, and, and firmly I see Hyperledger there, or it's the global governance organizations, um, like ICANN, IANA, that sort of thing. Um, 
And, and what you see happening in the cryptocurrency community today is a lot of uh, work at the, at the standards level and at the global governance level when it comes to responding to a hack or, or figuring out how to evolve the technology underlying Bitcoin or underlying Ethereum, um, and with the implementation kind of being left as an afterthought. And, and if there's a way for us to work with these communities, it's as being a home for the implementation. You'll never see a hyper coin, um, ever see us push a particular token, because I think that does tend to change the dynamics of a community pretty tremendously. But you could use this, our software to set up a coin. Uh, you could use, uh, a, a, at least the software that I would love to see us become a home for, um, uh, to set up a coin, to set up these kinds of interesting applications. Uh, and I think there's a nice clean division between those two. Um, that's it. There's a lot more about, about uh, blockchain technology to tell you about at some point. Um, I, I encourage you today to dive into the project uh, and if you have any interest in this uh, and, uh, and, and help us out. Thank you very much.